We're now going to do a demonstration of the graph Laplacian itself. So let's start by reloading some of our previous code, the degree matrix, the function plot. And now we're going to define the graph Laplacian just like we did in the notes to be the degree matrix minus the adjacency matrix. So to look at our examples, here's the path graph, right? And we see that along the diagonal, we have a vertex of degree 1, 2, 2, and 1. Off the diagonal, we have negative ones where there are edges connecting the vertices of the path graph. We'll just show the path graph like this. So we can see that the numbering of the vertices is indeed 1, 2, 3, 4. OK, now if we take the cycle graph, which I had better make the cycle graph 4, we can see again the same form. Four vertices. Uh, here each of degree 2, negative ones where the edges are. Okay, now let's look at our proposition about the quadratic form in the graph Laplacian. So remember we defined QLG to be the dot product of x and the graph Laplacian multiplied by x. So for instance, for the path graph, that's this quadratic polynomial in entries x1, x2, x3, and x4 at the vertices. Of course, if we compare that to what we think it is, x1 minus x2 squared plus x2 minus x3 squared plus x3 minus x4 squared, we get some other quadratic polynomial. And of course, they're exactly equal. Uh, you can check that mechanically with Mathematica by simplifying the expression one equals the other, and you get true. Here's the code that defines the spectrum. Here's the example for the path graph, for the cycle graph, and for the complete graph. Okay, you can notice a couple things, right? Uh, all the spectra include zero. In fact, that's the lowest eigenvalue for all our graphs. There's one lowest eigenvalue for the path graph, two repeated lowest eigenvalues for the cycle graph, and three repeated lowest eigenvalues for the complete graph. And finally, uh, the graph spectrum, the values, seem to be increasing as we add more edges to the graph. So it seems to be increasing as the vertices become more and more connected with each other. Now we'll just look again at our three graphs and observe that, if you like, they have the same four vertices, but we've added one edge here to here to make the cycle graph, and we've added edges cutting the diagonals to make the complete graph. That, I guess, is a little harder to see uh, because this sort of dart shape is the four cycle, and then we've added this and this as the diagonals. Now, we can tell more about the spectrum if we understand what the eigenvectors are. So we're going to do a little demonstration here. Let's look at the various eigenvectors as functions on the graph corresponding to the eigenvalues for our path graph. So here's 0. This is a constant function. The next one looks like this. The next one like that. And the third one is really wiggly. It looks like this. Now, that's all kind of interesting, right? And we can see the pattern a little better if we make the path graph a lot bigger 
So let's try, oh, let's see. I don't want to go to 40. Let's try 17. So here's the constant function. And now we can start to see this wobbling, which should look exceedingly suspicious to you. Right, because these look an awful lot like sines and cosines. Especially in the, the lower ones, where they're sort of high resolution. Now, we can see the same structure if we try the cycle graph. Again, we start with a constant function, and now we have more and more waves as we increase in eigenvalue. So this effect where the higher eigenvalue eigenvectors vary more is why we call them high frequency eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Back at the other side, we call these ones the low frequency eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Now we can look again at the complete graph with four vertices, but we see that the four different eigenvectors are the constant, which everybody seems to have, and then three, where the relationship between them is not completely clear. So let's try one more graph. Uh, we'll try, it's called the hypercube graph in three dimensions. So this is the skeleton of an actual cube. It's two squares here and here connected by four edges like this. And we can see, again, that there are some kind of beautiful symmetries in the eigenvectors, but that it's not really clear what they mean. Okay, well, what if we're laying out the vertices wrong along the plane here? After all, we just let Mathematica do that somehow. So let's try using the eigenvectors themselves as coordinates. So what we're going to do is we're going to just pick some, some eigenvalues. They're often called modes. And we're going to use them as the x and y or x, y, and z coordinates. So for instance, um, let's take our complete graph with four vertices. Let's look at its spectrum. And let's try drawing the complete graph with four vertices using eigenvalues two, three, and four. Uh, and you see something amazing, right? Which is you get this beautiful symmetric picture in three dimensions. Now, if we look at this for the cycle graph, we see two repeated eigenvalues and so I'm going to plot it using the first two eigenfunctions and look, we get a beautiful drawing again. In fact, if we take the 16 uh, vertex cycle graph, then we see that in the spectrum, we get again two repeated eigenvalues. 
and we get exactly the drawing we'd like to see, the cycle graph represented as vertices on a perfect circle. So one of the things we can conclude from this, and we'll study this as a theorem later in the course, is that the number of times the lowest non-zero eigenvalue is repeated is kind of telling you the dimension the graph wants to be in. So for instance, if we take this hypercube graph, we see there are three twos in the spectrum. And if we take the spectral drawing of the hypercube graph with modes two, three, and four, oops, I gotta put the three in, we see, look, it's exactly the embedding we expect to see in three dimensions. Now, um, what about, of course, the four-dimensional hypercube graph? Um, we can take a look at what that looks like in Mathematica's drawing. It's actually really pretty, isn't it? Uh, this is two cubes connected to each other vertex to vertex by a family of new edges. Um, but if we embed it in R3, that's a little clearer. You can see one cube here and another cube sort of interlaced with it. But notice that if we took 3, 4, and 5, we get a different very symmetric drawing of the hypercube graph that I quite like. So choosing these eigenvectors can be the secret to revealing unexpected symmetries in the graph. Um, let's take a look at some more graphs. So a thing you can do in Mathematica, and I'll, I'll show you how to do it, is if you know a mathematical object and you can't think of what Mathematica might call it, but you can think of some English words that describe it. You can try command equals, control equals, I'm sorry, uh, and type something like octahedral graph. All right, it recognized it. And if I hit shift enter, you see this graph. Um, now, it's not so obvious what the octahedral graph has to do with the octahedron, although it's true that every vertex here has degree four, and they're connected in a wonderfully regular way. But if we look at the spectrum of the octahedral graph, we see these three fours in a row, which makes you think that it might look nicer if you plotted it in three dimensions using the spectral drawing. And lo and behold, the spectral drawing of the octahedral graph is indeed the platonic solid. It's the octahedron. Um, now, of course, I would be remiss if I didn't do this for the other platonic solids. You've seen the cube and the tetrahedron. But what about the dodecahedral graph? Here it is in all its pentagonal beauty. Here are its three repeated eigenvalues. And here is its spectral drawing. Very cool, right? Um, I will do this again for the icosahedral graph. Finding its three repeated eigenvalues.
and taking its spectral drawing. That's very cool. Now, we've looked a lot at drawing graphs with their low frequency eigenvalues. It would be a little remiss of me not to point out that you can learn a lot by plotting it with the high frequency eigenvalues too. To see that, let's go back to something like the cycle graph with 14 vertices, and I'll just scroll straight to the end. Notice that this function uh, goes up and down in an alternating way all the way around the ring. So if I were to take the spectrum of the cycle graph with 14 edges um, and write it as a decimal, we could see that its spectral drawing this time with the high frequency eigenvectors 12, 13, and 14 looks like this. Now if I rotate it, you'll suddenly see what's going on. Uh, what I've done is I've drawn all of the even numbered vertices, and there are seven of them on the top ring, and all of the odd-numbered vertices, there are also seven of them on the bottom ring. So what this drawing has revealed is that you can split this cycle graph into two parts with no connections between vertices in each part, and only connections between the two parts. This is called a bipartite graph, and we'll study it more later. Okay, I encourage you to download the Mathematica notebook yourself and make your own spectral drawings. They're actually really amazing. Okay, uh, on to the homework.